All right, it looks like it's going live. This is Roxanne Swainhart broadcasting on Hukalo TV, and this is our, let's say, pilot edition, our first edition of what you would call uh, Hukalo Story Time. And we had this idea with the Hukalo founders to provide a platform for whoever wants to come in and tell their story, a story, a moment in their life. It really matters not. There will be channeled stories on here from different beings that will come in and channel a story. Um, we will have um, our members also speak of their idea of uh, maybe their awakening, which I'm going to speak about today and tell you guys my story on how I woke up, that kind of idea. Story, and story, a moment in their mute Amy real quick. Thank you. And uh, so, hi Amy. Um, so that's what I'm going to do today. And so we just really wanted to get it out there because story storytelling, guys, is is beautiful. It's it it's lessonary. It has meaning in it. It has imagination in it. It has feeling, emotion. It takes you on a whimsical ride and. Uh, you know, much like reading an idea book, just speaking those words from your individual personality and just letting it flow really engages and captures people and brings them into your world. And then you guys just journey in this wonderful story together, and it's really beautiful. So um, so we're live now. We're broadcasting on uh, Hukalo TV. So all of you out there in Hukalo, hi, everybody. And I know Paula's watching. Hi, darling. Love you. All right. And so we have Amy in the room. We have Gabriel in the room. We have... Dan, Dan the Guru Man here hosting for us. We appreciate them. Yasmina is here. Johannes is here. Kim's here. Merlo is here. Marlo is here. Sorry. Merlo, I keep thinking of red wine and I want to drink you. Yeah. Oh my. Valerie is here and as well as Will. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So Dan, real quick, if you can put me as presenting so uh, it'll stay on. Um, for the people, there we go, for the people on the YouTube channel I'm watching as well. Okay, so I'm going to start with my individual story, okay, on my awakening. Um, to give background, for me personally, I think it started when I realized I was ready to transition. And... I will, let's say, prepare yourself in a way if you want to. It really doesn't matter. Um, but I'm very naked with my story, and sometimes I, am, I, I, I hold nothing back, and I'd love to share all of my perspectives. And some people go, oh, my God, I can't believe you shared that, that kind of idea. So the reason why I want to, you know, I, the reason why I equate waking up and my transgender being, uh, you know, choosing to, shift and transition into um, a female is because that moment and I did it when I was let's see 2040 oh, it's 2015 five years ago I'm 48 so what's that 43 so 43 years old is when I transitioned and so from 0 to 43 I was never happy <laughs> and the day I walked out of that house as a woman that's where it started it's like you know that little marble that bangs around in that game and you're trying to get it into the hole and it can never find the hole and then boom it fell in the hole when I told myself it's okay to be who you are and this sense of peace just fell over me you know it was a struggle it was a struggle I remember when I was eight years old and when my mom and dad would leave I would run into their bedroom and take out my mom's stockings and shoes and bras and I'd dress up, you know. And uh, I would do that and it was like, <sighs> I was so happy. <laughs> I was. But everything told me up here, everything told me that was wrong to the point of the guilt, the guilt the guilt. Oh, God. I used to kick the living shit out of myself. I would hit myself. I hit myself a lot growing up, saying I was wrong. I would hit myself and go, damn it. Because, because my parents were Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. But they weren't like huge churchgoers. 
but the church was around me and I felt it. I felt that sin. I felt that guilt. I felt that I'm I'm something's wrong with me because in the mirror was being represented on what's right. And as I'm traveling through my times, um, wanting to be a you know, I couldn't even I couldn't I couldn't even identify it. But I I knew I wasn't fitting in what I was supposed to be. And then when I realized I was kind of a guy, after you stop playing in, in up until like maybe 10 years old, all I did was play. I rode my bike, played with my GF, G, GI Joes and, of course, my Barbies that were hidden. <laughs> Don't tell. So I would play with my GI Joes and stuff, you know, and, and play with my bike and, and play with my friends. And all I wanted to do was fucking play, okay? And then all of a sudden, everyone's not playing anymore. They're they're talking grown up stuff, or you know, which I consider teenage years. So they were talking differently, and I remember I was on the monkey bars with a whole bunch of guys, um, and I would believe I was I think about eleven, twelve, yeah, twelve years old at school, and they were talking about girls, you know, talking about the idea of girls, you know. And I was like, okay, I'm a guy, and I can understand this, but <laughs> let me. T- <laughs> I didn't understand what the hell they were thinking. <laughs> I was like, what are you guys talking about? The way they were, they they were all agreeing with each other on how they should get the girl, or they're this and they things, and I was like, okay, I am in an alien fucking world. I didn't understand. I didn't understand. But I try to fit in. And whatever my suggestion was, because I had such a fucking need for acceptance. I always wanted to be liked. I mean, just a really side note, I would give up everything to be liked. And that that, that cost you a lot. <laughs> At the time, I mean, of course, I perceived it. It cost me a lot because I would give my toys away and go the extra mile. And, you know, as you're going through life, you give up yourself to make other people happy. And then... You don't get back that gratitude because the mirror says, you know, now that I know, the mirror is not going to give you gratitude back because you're not expecting it. You're just trying to be accepted. Oh, amazing. I've learned so much. My God. Okay. So I, I knew I wasn't fitting in there. And then I think at 11, I think at 11 is when I start playing again with the, with the uh, clothes again. But this time it was more, I had more of a look about it. I had more of a feeling about it that it was more peaceful. I wasn't as scared doing it. And that's when it shifted from guilt to, let's say, disobeying, you know, secret. You know, I didn't care about the guilt anymore because I was happy, but I couldn't tell anyone. So I defended against it and I would hide it very well. And oh my God, thinking I was going to get caught, and then did I put everything back the right way? Are they going to suspect? Oh, my mind, it was always spinning. They're going to find out. They're going to find out. And my, my, my night times going to bed were filled with fear of being caught, or did I do this right? Did I hide this right? Did I put it back right? Is she going to notice? And all of this stuff just always going through my mind. And I was doing it like every every time they would leave the house, I would go and do it. You know, uh, pantyhose were the big thing. Wearing the pantyhose, the big thing. You know, um, loved loved them. Shit, woo, loved it. So then there was a time, and I was twelve years old, and my brother was having his friends sleepover. And this is where it gets a little brutal for some people, but I'm going to speak my joy because it's my journey. Hmm. They had a sleepover at the house. And one of my brother's friends, we were all sleeping on the couch and the floor and stuff, and he kind of got like a little fun with me. And I didn't quite understand what he was doing, but he was playing with Mr. Hoo-Ha, right? So I'm not going to give you the details of it, but that's where I gave my first blowjob at 12 years old. Now, imagine if you will, a guy that understands what it is to be gay because it's being represented in the mirror through a couple of interactions that it's deathly wrong, sinful, 
Think about that guilt I was going through. Mm-hmm. Guys, I'm not looking for your sympathy or pity. Just know that I just really want to give this to you because it's so epic. It's so fucking epic. So think about that image of me doing what I was doing, what was going through my head and the guilt, but here's the key. It was perfect. I loved it. You know? It's like I know that anyone out there that encounters with a sexual interaction right now and they're doing it with the gender that they prefer, whether it's male or female, whether you're male or female, all that's past. It's beautiful. (laughs) It is. It's a sharing of energies that is just, let's say, beyond measure. You forget about everything. You're in the moment. You let yourself go and you're vulnerable. And I was, and I loved it. And of course, afterwards, I was guilty. Oh shit, yeah, I was, I was, well, I was, was really guilty. And I was mad at myself. I'm gay. I'm gay. I can't tell my dad because my dad's a Republican. Hmm? My dad's a Bible busting Republican. He wasn't really a big Bible buster, but you know, he had that structure in him from the family. They weren't big churchgoers, but they went to church a lot. So, you know, that's in there. You know, Jesus, the sin, you know, you're the devil, all this shit. Yes, you're right. You're right, Marlo. It does recharge your vital energy. Sex does, was what Marlo just wrote in the chat. So, that's where my journey, you know, was, was with finding myself truly. Everything on the outside says you can't do this. Everything on the inside said you can. It's you. You were comfortable. I loved it. It felt me. It made me live. And I, I, I tried to kiss girls and stuff. And yeah, I did. It was exciting, but it wasn't. It wasn't the game. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't sync. That kind of idea. So, um, I'm, I'm I'm figuring this other part. No, uh, yeah, I we got to talk. I'm talking to my guides. <laughs> so, no, we're not. Yeah, this the, this part doesn't have really much to do with it. So we're not going to talk about that. So, anyways, I'm going through my life, and um, I was in Germany at that time. The next time that I interacted with the idea of homosexuality, and I really enjoyed it. And then. There was also a girl there that we did some kissing and stuff, but we didn't do anything sexual because I uh, I wasn't sure it was quite right. Went back to the States after a few years of living in Germany, which was a playground, truly, and got back to high school. I was in high school in Germany, uh, age 9 and 10, but I was a kid. You know, I was a geek. I was, you know, a 98-pound weakling because I wrestled 98 pounds, and I was a 98 pound, and I was geeky, because I didn't think like the guys. I wasn't trying to be cool. I wasn't trying to have a status. I wasn't trying to be that. I couldn't be cool, because I didn't want to be cool. You know, I didn't fit. So I said, okay, forget it. I'm just going to try to be me. Uh, I tried to change myself many times. (laughs) Oh, my God. And it was always a train wreck. (laughs) When you always try to fill yourself with an idea of someone else's image of what you're supposed to be, oh my God, it's a train wreck. <laughs> it really is. And I did that a few times, and it doesn't work. So I would just try to try to get through it. You know, my brother's approval, trying to be what he wanted me to be, and some of the friends and such. But when I moved back to the states, my brother wasn't around anymore. He had gone off to college, and then I was at high school, and then I was in band, and I met some people that were geeky like me because, you know, we were in the band. And there were some geeky people there, and that was good, you know, and I, I found friends, and I found comfort, and this was the time of growing older, and by now, it's like my hormones are popping, and I'm ready to experience myself more, you know, and I got a girlfriend, and that's where I lost my virginity is with this girlfriend, and I became an idea of what I was supposed to be doing, and it didn't work out well. Well, I couldn't keep a girlfriend because I was the girl in the relationship, and two girls don't want two girls in a relationship. Even if it's two physical girls together, there's always an idea of a positive and a negative or a male and a uh, female role, 
always. That's the energies that flow. There's not usually two idea females. You know, there's a male and a female. You know, that kind of idea um, that connect. And I was always taking the submissive role, the woman role. And uh, they wanted a leader. They wanted someone. I was so afraid to tell them. You know, I, I, I watched how guys treated girls sometimes, and I was like, "How the?" F and I watched them run right back to them. I was like, "What the fuck? I don't know what to do here." And you know, I was very confused. You know, my mind was like loopy. You know, because I'm I'm battling in this. I'm battling in this. My urges with men. My urges with uh, filling that the role of trying to be a man to a woman. Train wreck. You know, very tough. So I'm I'm working my way through life and 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 um, I grew my hair long and in and after high school I got that, you know that like the mullet I guess you know the soccer cut whatever so I looked good in the 80s and I just went out and I was like you know you know this is a good looking guy and I did well and I went out and I start fucking I just start fucking every girl I can find you know and I was just banging my brains out trying to figure out what I was, you know, I, 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 again, it was an image, I thought I could have sex to my peace, and that was wrong, and every once in a while, I would find myself, finding myself, pushing myself to go and find a man, you know, and I was away at college, and I found a couple, and I experienced, and I was right, it was right, but here's the key, guys, I couldn't view myself as gay. I couldn't see myself as an, with another man. But I love making love to men. Oh, yes. But I could not see. I, I, I got the image. You know what the image is? I got a wife. First one didn't last long. Got a second wife. That one lasted long. She's one of my best friends now. And then got a third wife later in life. I have a set of wives. I tried to be all of that image all the way up until I was in my 40s. Always jumping into, you know, uh, gay clubs, finding that. But I couldn't see myself. This is the key. This is, was key for me. I couldn't see myself as gay. I couldn't see myself with another man. <clears throat> and then my third wife, we were very kinky. You know, me growing up having a lot of sex. It's like anything else. You're trying to get satisfied and you never can find satisfied because you're trying from the wrong perspective to be satisfied. So you just explore the sexual world and I found some very, very, let's say, deep fetishes. So we got into the one time, this is my third wife, and we got into bondage. And while one day while we're in bondage, but we didn't get real hardcore, but we had some stuff to tie, tie up and stuff like that, having some fun with that. She dressed me up. She dressed me up to be the bitch. And had a strap on, the whole thing. And after we're done having sex, I'm looking myself in the mirror, dressed up as a woman, with the makeup and everything. And that was it. I saw myself as a woman for the first time. That's what I knew, what I was missing. The reason why I couldn't see myself with another guy being gay is because I was viewing myself as a guy. And I'm not gay. I'm heterosexual. Well, I'm bisexual. If there's a puppy pile going on somewhere, I'll join in, sure. But now that I view myself from a woman's point of view, I moved into the idea of that's why I'm so attracted to men. Because I'm that. I'm that female vibration wanting the man. And I was trying to be a man, getting a man to fill myself. And that was the key. And I saw myself. And poof. I was done. I knew it. And when I started to look into my transgender, read about the Harry Benjamin syndrome, um... That's a theory about uh, this psychologist, uh, doctor, theorized since every fetus is at birth born conceived as a female and after the hormone washing, the body becomes male. And then there's another hormone washing, which the mind becomes male. 
and my body became a male, but the mind did not get the hormone washing to turn the male triggers on. So there's a we all know there's a di distinct difference, physical size and such, between male and female minds. So that that's you know I equated it to that and I accepted that, and uh, I was I was happy. I was like, wow, scared as shit. Because I'm a 43-year-old man that works in the car business, making $150,000 a year as an image to people, to my salesmen, to my customers. And I was out there, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I was like, I can't. I, I couldn't do it. It was like I was, I almost wanted to throw up walking out of the house as a man again. And I struggled to get through it so I can figure out how I can transition without my world collapsing, my money, my friends, everything that I found valuable, my parents, acceptance. I'm still, I'm still asleep. I needed acceptance. I still wanted acceptance. My friends my job, my bosses, my image in Las Vegas among the car business. The car, the car business is a small world. Um, a lot of salesmen, but a lot of them go and stay. Managers have been in there. We know each other in that area very well. So that, that was going to be tough for me. So I took it slow. I started wearing clear nail, and I started wearing eyeshadow that was... Uh, you know, the same color as my skin. It was making me feel good, but I couldn't hold it back. So now this became like a little bit of a polish, like a little pearly, and this became a little darker. And as soon as I get home off of work, off the man clothes, and poof, right into Roxanne, you know? And uh, I started that transition. And that was a peaceful time for me at home. I was never happier. I knew I had to go and play the game, and I would toughen myself up, psych myself up to get out there and be the man. And that when I was, that's when I was new. I was playing a role, and I, I knew it. So I worked it magically, slowly, synchronistically, following my intuition. Didn't know it at the time. But managed to transition and stayed on my job a year and a half after I fully transitioned. Told my bosses, came out to them, said, hey, I'm turning into a woman, and I really hope you don't fire me. What they actually did was actually give me another job. I stayed with the inventory, and I was helping with the accounting, and they kept me on, and my pay went down. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> But I was fine. And so a year and a half later, I think it was because I wore a couple too short mini skirts to work. <laughs> Got a few complaints. <laughs> and they ended up letting me go. And that's fine because I was ready to go. I harbor no oil well. That was one thing that I did learn before I woke up is like, let it go. I start letting that shit go. There were some things that made me very angry that I was that I harbored, that I found valuable. Criticism of me after I would try to work my ass off and did do it the, the way they expected it was my best me, but they couldn't expect it, so I got upset. You know, that was that was part of my thing. So I left. I left about six months later. I got I got uh, unemployment. Six months later, my dad said, "Why don't you come and move out here?" move out here to Vegas, or to from Vegas to San Antonio because the government and Obama he mentioned that now that on the government applications it's male female other well I'll consider me another that's fine as long as I can get that security of a job so I moved out here moved in with my parents and remained on unemployment for let's say I got there in June and it lasted till April of 2013 I was looking for jobs. Nothing came. I tried dealership jobs. Um, I was, yeah, they, it, it was tough getting turned down. <laughs> yeah, especially with my resume and, 
you know, my talent, you know, that's not bragging. I'm fucking good car guy, you know. So, uh, yeah, car guy. Yeah, it's funny. They say, oh, car guy. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I, I couldn't get the job, and I did everything I could, and mom and dad were tolerant. They saw me for the first time transitioning they were doing their best I love them and just to let you know guys they love me now because I love me so I got the new version of my parents oh yes <laughs> yeah so when the unemployment ran out my parents told me this they said listen Roxanne <clears throat> you can eat here for free you can live here for free but we can't pay for your needs you you know you're costing you're you're costing us our retirement you're infringing upon our retirement and that's their choice that's their perceived value that's that's wonderful i understood that now normally remember i was very scared about a lot of things i was very fearful of judgment and getting things wrong my entire life because i was told many times you fucked it up and Here's another way. They, you screwed this up. Oh, I fucking hate that. <laughs> Anyways, so um, I l they told me that, and I went upstairs to my bedroom, and I sat down, and I was like, okay, what the fuck am I going to do now? And right there, guys, I don't have the words. But I was this this blanket. No, it wasn't even a blanket. A washing. Ah, thank you. Whoosh, a piece. Much like the same day I looked in the mirror when I was dressed as a woman. The same thing. And I knew it. I said, "This is going to be okay." And I told him, "I said, no problem. I'll figure this out. I'm not even worried about it." And of course, you better worry about it because you need to get this, and yeah, then we're not going to keep you here. We're going to. I was like, okay, when do you want me to leave? And they told me a date, and I said, okay, that day I'll be gone. Trust me. And I didn't even know what the fuck I was saying. I was like, oh god, I can't even believe I'm saying that. Usually, it's like, oh, please, don't, oh, help me, uh, uh, victim. No, not this time. I don't know what it was. I know now, but not at that time. So, I was going to a guided meditation group. No, not yet. Pardon me. Jumped ahead. Let's go back a little bit. I was in the VA, the Veterans Administration. <clears throat> the Veterans Administration <laughs> um, program to help vets, because I spent my five years in the Army, um, get jobs and get back into society. Well, this was a nice program. They taught me everything I already knew. They were telling you how to dress for interviews, and I've interviewed more people than I can even imagine. I knew that program, but in that program, there were job opportunities. You know, they would help you match. And I was like, okay, this is a good program. I, not, you know, of course, I'm judging it because I know all this stuff, and I had a little ego about it, of course. But there was a one time that I was sitting in this conversation. We were talking about things about getting jobs and honing our job skills, if you will. <clears throat> and this one girl said, hey, why don't you check out this program? It's called VASH, Vehicle, uh, there I go, Vehicle, uh, Veterans Administrating Supplemental Housing. And I said, okay, let me go check that out. So she gave me the number. I called them after the meeting, and they said, yeah, sure, come on down. We can make an appointment and uh, fill out some paperwork. So I it was actually across the street, so I went that afternoon, right after our thing, went over there. I got a call a week later, and my caseworker interviewed me and said, okay, you do qualify for this program. So I got the program. She goes, you're going to get a housing voucher for supplemental housing from Bear County, uh, appointment first and then see if you can get the voucher which you should because they have so many I mean, it's not a problem and she goes three to four weeks maybe a little bit longer you'll get your first appointment and then it'll be about three to four weeks after that so I went and told my parents this is what's going on I'm in this program so I'm doing my best and just let you know getting in the update you know 
And <laughs> I got a call a week later. And they say, your voucher's been approved. Go down there tomorrow and fill out the paperwork and pick it up. So here's week one, week later. So I got the first interview. Second week, I went down there, got my voucher the next day. That week, I went out okay, to find my apartment. And the third week, I found it. During the second week, there was a job fair, and I got hired by West Communications to be a telephone receptionist for taking credit card uh, applications over the phone. That third week is when I got hired as well. So in a matter of three weeks, my first appointment, and then I got my apartment, got my job, moved into my apartment, and started my job Oh, about three days after that. So within a month's time, I moved out. I got everything I needed. I got bed donated to me. I got all the program uh, stuff donated to me. I got furniture donated to me. I got um, cookware, coffee, coffee maker, oh, yeah. donated to me. Everything I needed, it was a turnkey operation and started my job the next week. And qualified for food stamps that came in all in from July 1st to July 29th the day I started my job I was self-sufficient and that was amazing to me and I'm also during this time of all this happening was with that guided meditation group and they were awake wink Rita which now a lot of you know is in the background running the camera for me. And I was telling them this stuff, and they're like, this is amazing. You're waking up. And I was like, what is waking up? Anyway, I keep hearing you guys talk about awake. So they were telling me, and they're like, you need to listen to this guy called Bashar. And I went home and clicked on my YouTube in my own little apartment, had my little um, laptop, and had internet from my neighbor, that I met, and I was always a nice person. I was like, hi, where are you? Hey, you have internet? Can I hijack it? And he goes, sure, come on. You know, so I got my internet, and it was, it was magical. I start watching Bashar, and it's like, <gasps> it's like I cannot get enough of this. I called it home. It was like, oh my God, what is this? What is it? Why is it clicking? Why is it resonating? And I thought back to parts of my life where when I was in my job and, and in interaction, I was always a good speaker. I was always a great listener, and I had this philosophy behind it. I understood it, and this was the same feeling. It just clicked. It just flowed. It was just freaking magical, magical, and I'm watching this for a month straight. Abraham, Cryon, Bashar, Tom Kenyon, meditating with the Hathors, figuring all of this stuff out. People are giving me books. I read... Um, the Ramtha book, the White book, the books one and two. I read the Hathor book. The I read Ra books. I read uh, I don't even know where it's at. Uh, uh, the Only Planet of Choice. Um, uh, there's a Ranchura, Ran Urantia. Holy cow! Whoa, what a book! Just was feeding, feeding myself. I couldn't get enough. I never read for school. I hated to read. I didn't do my homework. I would wing it just to get by because I had no interest in it. None. I haven't read so much. I read more in that couple of months' time than I read my entire life, I guarantee it. Wait, double more. More than double. And I just read, and I'm just filling my heart with everything that I've been missing. And I'm a full-blown woman ready to be myself Finally, I got one piece of the puzzle. Be the transgender. Live that. Love that. Scared of shit. Always looking for approval. Wanted to be pretty enough. Living in the life. Trying to dress girly. High heels, lipstick, nails. The whole thing to be the image. The image. And now I do. Now I know. Now I know. I never needed to be the image. <laughs> I do it for me now. And I was, just think about that release. I found who I was and I was happy, but I wanted the world to approve of me, so I wanted to do everything. I wanted to get the big boobs. I got hormones now. They're big cups. You know, I really want big cups, but they're getting there. I wanted to lose the nose. I wanted to get the brow browsing, you know? 
don't have this Cro Magnum thing, you know, and the upper lip, big lip, you know, to do all that surgery so I could feel like a woman to the world image wise. But now I know I never needed to be the woman in image. I needed to be the woman in here. And I'm not just the woman. I am who I am in the moment. I have both vibrations in me. You know, I'll, I'll watch the game with you on, on Monday Night Football and I'll, you know, cheer as loud as any guy. And then I'll go to the kitchen and make you dinner, baby. You know, I will. <laughs> I got both in me and I love that. It's here and there and it's, oh, it's beautiful. So I woke up. I, I, I just said, fuck it, I'm awake. And I went to this Law of Attraction meeting and they wanted me to speak. You know, tell my story in this first law of attraction meeting. My friend invited me there, and I, I went there, and I'm my turn to speak and tell who I am. And I'm listening to about a month of ascension stuff, law of attraction stuff. And man, did I get diarrhea of the mouth. Oh, poof. I mean, I went at it, and oh, it was flowing out of me. And I was like, holy shit, where is this stuff coming from? I loved it. I was alive. I was feeling. I was engaging. And I was me. Oh, nothing greater. Oh, yeah. So they asked me, the lady that ran that, she goes, asked me, she goes, hey, would you speak at one of our meetings as you as the speaker? And I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. And I got... That, uh, uh, I think it was three weeks later, I went and I spoke to this group of Law of Attraction, about 40 people. My parents came, and I'm doing a lot of work. You know, My parents came, and I spoke and did my thing, and you know, it was awesome. And then uh, someone said, hey, can I get a session with you? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then I had to go ask my friend Wink. I said, Wink, she wants a session. What is that? <laughs> and then and I said, how much should I charge? You know, and she goes at least a hundred dollars. I was like, "Oh my God, there's no way! I can't ask right now for a hundred dollars." Here comes the money game. This is my abundance. You know, I was taught. Listen to me very closely. I was taught not to like money. Money's bad. Money's dirty, and that's a deep ingrained. And here's the big one: you don't deserve money. People like us don't get that. Oh yeah. So I've pushed money away. All my life. I made a shitload of money, but let me tell you something. I spent it. My wife, all of them, had the best. My, I think my Molly had 32 Dooney and Burke purses. Yikes. And I had my clothes, and that was it. You know, I didn't do anything for me. I did it for them because I didn't deserve the money. I bought a house. But that was for Molly, and she decorated it, you know, and that's wonderful. I gave them that, and that was 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 filling my heart at the time. But I couldn't keep money because mm -mm, I didn't deserve it. Right here, my this construct, whew, in one, out the other. They even say Sagittarians spend the money as soon as they get in. And <clears throat> as me being a Sagittarian, that one was true. <laughs> so yeah, so then. When I was, I just thought about something, you know, it was, it was tough. So she wanted a session. Um, and I said, okay. So I booked to her session. She came over to my apartment and we talked and she paid me and I asked her for $60. Okay. I said, no, 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 no. This was the first one. It was a donation. And she gave me $60. So I said, okay. Maybe I'll be $60 worth. And I always ask for donations at first, guys, because I didn't think I was worth a set price. I thought Ascension meant, don't worry about it. The universe will take care of you. But it was truly what my self-worth was. Hmm? And I did get donations. I got food. I got cigarettes. I got eggs. I got coffee. I got furniture. I got money. For these sessions, I was exchanging the energy with. Hmm? I got everything I needed. But that's all I thought I was worth. Mediocrity. Because my mom taught me that. My mom was Greek. That's nothing to do with it. But she grew up during the war. 
when the idea uh, Germany, uh, uh, let's say, invaded Greece and her dad was killed during that war and they were dirt poor, literally living in a cabin, dirt floors, dirt poor. And so she always saw the dirt poor and she always scavenged and, and, and kept. So ingrained with her is whatever you have, you have to keep and you have to be thankful for any ounce of idea. You could not have, have indulgences because that was bad. That was sin. That was going over. No, 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 no. You need to be meek. You need to be poor. You need to be that to have that spiritual life on the other side. So that, that, that was in me. And I, I couldn't get past the idea that I was worth more than $60 an hour or whatever they choose, truly. You know, that was my idea. That was creating my universe because no one else is saying it's right or wrong. No one else is telling me that, let's say, you can ask for more money or not. No one's telling me anything. They're not saying anything that, at all except you create your universe, Roxanne. So whatever your self-worth is, is what, to yourself is what you get back in the mirror. And I was starting to see that I was not happy with what I was getting. I was mediocre with it. I was getting by, but I truly wanted and deserved more. You know, I did because that was allowed. But boy, the guilt would kick the shit out of me. Said, no, you're not. Spirituality is meek, humble. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't doing it at the expense of others. I was doing it for myself, and I still had I had to unwind that one. I wasn't hurting anyone. I wasn't going out or robbing or stealing or, or, or you know, trying to hurt or, or say bad things. I, I'm a, I'm a loving, I'm a loving motherfucker. I love humanity. I love them. But I was still, I wanted to do everything for them, but I just couldn't get back what I wanted. And I'm feeling guilty about that. But then I was allowed, and I was going through this struggle about that shit. So I worked, had some more sessions, and started Odyssey of Ascension. One month after I started my phone job, I quit. I said, I trust the universe. I quit. I was getting a couple of sessions here and there. I had a vehicle. I had everything I needed. Everything. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to trust the universe. I'm going to quit my job. And I did. My rent was $60 a month, all bills included. I was pretty much set there. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, I can handle that. One paid all my thing. I had food stamps. That was good for another three months. So I was set. I had everything. I was like, yeah, I'm good. I laid out my security <laughs> in the future to make this move. But that was what I said at the time to help me make that move. And it worked. So I quit. I quit my job. And I started Odyssey of Ascension, and I would – I didn't even start the website yet. You know, I was just going to these Law of Attraction meetings, and I was getting a session here or there, and I was meeting people at the guided meditation group, and I was reading at home and obsessed and obsessed. And then <laughs> here comes this one day. It was in November. It was like a month, a month later after I quit my job. And I was meditating, and I was oming, and I was doing the Tom Chakra, Tom Chakra, Tom Kenyon idea of the chakra tones within me, and my shifting my tones up and down to where I felt the vibrational match to the chakra, you know. And I'm toning, and then one day I'm toning, and all of a sudden, here it comes. The toning got shorter and shorter and shorter. And then I shifted into this language, you know, and I'm just, I'm just speaking. And I was like, what am I saying? And then here's the voice. You know what you're saying. Speak it again. So I spoke it, and there's the translation. So I start writing it down, and sure as shit, I was like, holy cow, this is real for me. Because I was saying stuff I never read, never understood, never experienced. Started writing down and started this blog idea after I got all this information and poof, 
you know I'm just writing story about story about story timelines and all of this stuff is just flowing out of me and then I get this voice he goes hi and I said hello he goes you want a channel and I said yeah I do I would love the channel he goes my name is Hugh and I'm here to teach you to channel and I was like awesome all right let's begin so he took me through me the steps of channeling and the first process was to have a group of people in the room have the entities there that were let's say different species would come in and started with the Parisians for me and they would ask questions or they would first say something to me and I would speak it to them to the people in the room the message if you will and then they would ask questions to me and I would translate it to them and they would tell me and I translate it back and then I was channeling through that medium so that's how it first started and Hugh said here's what's happening okay understand the flow and it's not your imagination but it is your imagination you know and I was like okay I got that so that started to flow and then he goes now you're gonna channel a being so we're gonna bring in Akina one of your council of elevens and I said okay so she started idealizing speaking through me so I was channeling and then Osipius came and then that happened and you know and now I'm channeling every day and now I'm and he, here's the thing I am I woke up and I had so many fucking definitions of what what it was to be awake I had a million definitions spirituality is this spirituality is that and every single day since that waking up all I find is more limitations within me but you know what the greatest thing about that is is every limitation I see is one that I now know I feel and now I'm that much more free it's beautiful it's like I'm not trying to ascend <laughs> I don't want to be anything except me I am so free right now it's unbelievable to be this free and here's the key I can't explain it to you I can't <laughs> I don't have the words what it is to be free and I found it I say to myself and this is for me I figured out the game I have and it took me channeling motherfucking the universe loving myself finding myself hating myself guilt acceptance criticism anger pain every freaking emotional manageable idea of the construct of humanity I engaged in not because it's <laughs> not because I'm fucking myself over it's because I wanted to feel what it was to be a human I wanted to understand every single ounce of what it means to be a human being and take this earth vacation is what now I call it and feel it from second to second until I choose to leave this room whenever that is and it's beautiful I know I woke up from me I don't worry about the ascension I'm not worried about who's this and what's happened or any of that shit because that's just concern for an idea I know this that I I affect the ascension by me loving me it's as simple as that that's the game be the brightest brightest shiniest most beautiful light to yourself and that only brightens humanity and then they choose don't worry if they do or not none of your concern keep doing you so I just want to tell you my story was finding me to go against everything that was status quo everything that was found valuable in a construct and when you challenge that construct you gain ridicule in the mirror you gained, you gained oppression you gained judgment attacks you know that's what you got back because I was defending against it 
And then I realized I didn't have to defend. The minute I stopped defending my stance, who I was, is the minute the world got brighter. Now, Cepheus told me one time, the first act of war is defense. And I said, yeah, you're right. So when I gave up trying to be any image, trying to be accepted, only just being me in the moment so I can understand the beauty of it, what it is to be a human in this now, in this lifetime, not worrying about where I'm going to go, where I was, where, where I'm needed, any of that. Just be now fully engaged in me in this now to experience Roxanne and give Roxanne every fucking help she deserves of life. Yeah. They're talking. <laughs> There's the Buya, honey. Right there is the Buya. Thank you so much, Roxy. You're welcome, so guys. And it's, it was really, really touching. And, you know, you just reinforce every day how amazing you are and what a wonderful example you are to human, human beings. And you know what? Even other species. So, just thank, thank you. you. So that's my waking up story, everyone. Thanks for tuning into it. Mwah. Yay! Okay, now you guys can unmute and let's chat. <laughs> if you choose. I choose. You rock, Roxy. That's all I got to say. Good job, Roxy. Awesome. Pretty cool story, Roxy. It was a badass. I love it. Thank you, Mark. I really, I really enjoy the puppy pile comment. <laughs> yes, yes, I've I've been involved in a few puppy piles. They're very fun. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, dirty, well, you dirty girl. Really need some puppy piles? I like have some for real. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, anyways, um, so Dan, I think we're done with our first adventure here. Um, to everyone out there, thank you so much for tuning in to the first broadcast of Storytime on Hukalo TV. So it'll be same time next week, and next week is of our very own Kim, who's going to be doing the idea of her story, whether she chooses to tell her awakening story or another story, matters not. Again, it's an all open platform. And then uh, that's it. We'll go from there. So out there, thank you all for tuning in. We love you very, very much, and uh, we'll see you all on the next now. All right? Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.